spend some time with us over a tea or a coffee. I'm going to ask you to turn to Psalm 26, which is on page 459. We're just going to be running through Psalms 25 to 34 over the next uh, nine or ten weeks, but I'm going to lead us in prayer before we read it together. Our Father, we want to thank you that you are a good and a gracious Lord who is full of steadfast love. We want to pray that you would help us to understand more and more of your love this morning, and not just in our heads, but that our hearts would be filled by your love, and that it might be kept before our eyes all of our days, and it might shape the way that we live and walk, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 26 then on page 459 of David. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and my mind. Your steadfast love is before my eyes and I walk in your faithfulness. I do not sit with men of falsehood, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord, proclaiming thanksgiving aloud and telling all your wondrous deeds. O Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Do not sweep my soul away with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men in whose hands are evil devices and whose right hands are full of bribes. But as for me, I shall walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. My foot stands on level ground. In the great assembly, I will bless the Lord. I hope you want to keep that open in front of you. There's also an outline of the sermon on the back of the notice sheet uh, as well. Let me start there with a quotation, see if you can guess how this sentence finishes. Um, The supreme quality for leadership is unquestionably blank. I don't know what you would say there. This is Dwight Eisenhower. He said, the supreme quality for leadership is unquestionably integrity. Uh, Here's another, the supreme quality of a man is not in how much he acquires, but in his integrity and his ability to affect those around him positively. You'll never guess who said that one. The well-known leadership expert and anthropologist Bob Marley was uh, the one who said that. We have a, a funny relationship with integrity. I think these, these days, uh, a lot of the time, it feels a little bit boring to us. It's a bit like flossing your teeth. It's something that you know is good for you, but you're not all that excited about doing. Until that is, you you have leaders who lack integrity. And I know it doesn't happen like this necessarily in every country, but all it seems to take here is a drinks party during COVID or a camper van that was bought with party funds. And a, a leader's career can be finished in an instant. Well, this morning we meet a, a man of rare integrity. He wasn't perfect, far from it, but in this psalm at least, King David is innocent of the charges that are being leveled against him, and so he asks God to vindicate him, he asks him to search his heart and test him, and ultimately to save him. But as we step into his world this morning, we're going to find our minds drawn to an even greater king than David, uh, one whose enemies could find no fault in him, one who only ever practiced what he preached all of the time one who remained faithful to God all of his days. And as we think about Jesus, we'll be asked which assembly or church we want to be a part of. I don't know if you noticed as we read it, but there are two assemblies or church, the word is the same, that are mentioned in the psalm. There's the assembly of evildoers that David shuns in verse 5. And then there's what he calls the great assembly in which he blesses the Lord in verse 12. And it's clear then in in which camp David puts himself. 
And as readers, God wants us to take sides. He wants us to nail our colors to the mast with him. Uh, Two questions as we reflect on it together, and we'll start with, how is your walk? Uh, Because throughout the psalm, David is presented both as the model king of God's people. We know he failed to live up to that at other times, but in this psalm, he's presented as the model king of God's people and as a model believer. And this language of walking in integrity brackets the song, there's a past, a present, and a future to it. So in verse 1, he says, vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. And the present is in verse 3, for your steadfast love is before my eyes. I walk in your faithfulness. And then the future in verse 11, as for me, I shall walk in my integrity. It's quite a bold thing to say, isn't it? I've trusted in the Lord without wavering. I've walked in integrity. Sometimes I think as Bible readers, we're not sure what to make of it. We know that the only person who was ever perfect all of the time was Jesus himself. And with, with David in particular, it feels a bit much to be saying things like this. We know he committed adultery with Bathsheba. The Bible tells us that, that he arranged for Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, to be killed. The Bible tells us that. So what are we to make of what's going on here? We don't know the... Um, the exact historical background. It it looks as though David is responding to some specific charges against him, enemies who are accusing him of falsehood of one kind or another. And David's saying, with respect to these charges at least, I am innocent. And so he prays, Lord, vindicate me, prove me, try me, test my heart and my mind. Those words testing and trying are used elsewhere to the process of melting and refining and purifying silver and gold. And David's saying, even if you melt me right down and you examine me, you'll discover that that not just in my outward actions, but even on the inside, at the level of motivation and desire, I've walked in integrity before the Lord. Uh, One of the commentators refers to a commencement address that I think I'd seen before at the University of Texas a few years ago. There's a guy called Admiral McRaven who uh, drew some lessons from Navy SEAL training for the the graduating class. And he talked about the bell that hangs in the middle of the compound where all of the recruits live and do their training. And they're told on day one, if you want to quit, if you want to end the torment of your training forever. All you have to do is walk up and ring that bell. And uh, the Admiral got very military about it all, as you can imagine, ring that bell. You don't have to wake up at 5 a.m., ring the bell. You don't have to swim in icy water, ring the bell. You're free from the runs and the obstacle courses. But, he said, if you want to change the world, don't ever ring the it's all very stirring stuff isn't it all very find the hero inside yourself I, it's slightly intimidating to be honest with you i think i'd be first up to the the bell but it did strike me as we read this psalm that here is the song of a, a king who refused to quit in his walk before the lord it is about david but really it's about jesus Even at his trial, Pilate said, I find no guilt in this man. Uh, Peter knew him as well as anyone. He said in all the time he knew him, never once did he say or do anything that was displeasing to God. I wonder how long we'd have to spend in one another's presence before we couldn't say that any longer. Jesus, perfectly righteous in every way, all of the time. And one of the things that happens to you as a reader, I I take it as you read Psalm 26, is that you find yourself thinking, I I would like to be more consistent. I would like to be more like Jesus. Uh, The the enemies that we have are the world, the flesh, and the devil. We're in a fight against sin every day of our life. So easy to ring the bell and go with the flow, give up in the battle. I hope verse 3 will help us then. This seems to be the key to David's devotion on his good days. This is what made him want to walk in integrity. He says, your steadfast love is before my eyes. I've lived like this because 
your steadfast love is before my eyes and I walk in your faithfulness. Steadfast love, faithfulness, they're, they're covenant words. They call to mind the way that God had saved his people in the past, the way that he'd promised to be good to them in the future. They're words of grace and goodness and commitment and mercy and truth. So the reason that David is so determined to walk in integrity before people and before God is that the steadfast love of the Lord was before his eyes. That is, he somehow reflected upon and meditated upon and thought about and taken into his heart and internalized what God has revealed about himself and his love so much that he now looks at the world through a, through a God filter or a, a God lens. That's why he wants to walk in a way that's pleasing to him. We see it again from verse 8. David says, O Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Don't sweep my soul away with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men, in whose hands are evil devices and whose right hands are full of bribes. But as for me, I shall walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. My foot stands on level ground. In the great assembly, I will bless the Lord. So David believes in accountability. He knows that he's not just answerable. You hear people say sometimes, don't you, the only person I ever have to answer to is myself. As long as I'm happy with myself, that's all that matters. That's a complete farce. David realizes that there is another verdict that matters much more than his own and more than anyone else's, that there's a day coming when all of us are going to stand before our God. And the only verdict that matters on that day won't be our verdict on God, but of course his verdict on us. But David knows that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. That's his hope. And so he doesn't fear that day. That's his confidence. I wonder how you relate to David as we read this, as you think about your own walk with and before the Lord, as you try in a few minutes, we're going to try and sing along with Psalm 26 at the end of our service. How far do you reckon as you start in verse one and go down, how far do you get through the song before the words start to stick in your throat uh, a little bit? I have walked in integrity. I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Your steadfast love is before my eyes. I find it so much easier to relate to what David said in last week's psalm. Do you, top of the column there, 25 verse 11. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. So I'd love to sing Psalm 26, but I feel a lot more Psalm 25. What do you, what do, you do with that gap between the song you'd like to be able to sing and the knowledge that your own heart is prone to wonder? Well, the answer, unsurprisingly, is that we take that gap straight to Jesus. Right at the, the heart of the Christian gospel is a great exchange. If you're looking in on Christianity from the outside this morning, you're not yet sure what you make of Jesus. I'd love you to, to concentrate on this little bit and to talk with us afterwards if you'd like to. You look at the, the track record of any and, and every Christian, and it is one of ongoing and wavering doubt, sin, and guilt. But despite that, the result of Jesus coming to earth is that when God looks at the, a Christian now, someone who's trusted in Jesus and is hidden in him, he doesn't see all of the mess and all of the mistakes. He sees us as being perfect in his sight. Uh, this psalm doesn't explain how that happens, but the verse on the, I put on the sheet from the New Testament does it's talking about Jesus and it says for our sake God made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God so there's Jesus he's perfect in every way uh, he knew what sin is intellectually of course but he'd never succumbed to sin or temptation that's the sense in which he knew no sin personally in the verse but then on the cross God made him who knew no sin to be sin as he laid upon Jesus the 
sins and the punishment that was due to all of God's people at any time in history. Now, I sometimes find it helpful to think of it like this, that because of all of my own sin, all of the ways in which I've fallen short of God's standards, even as we confessed it earlier, that it was, it was me that deserved to go to the cross, to face the penalty of death for my sin, and to face the wrath of God, to drink the cup of his wrath. But Jesus loved me and gave himself up for me. And so just as they were about to nail me to the cross, it's as though Jesus walked past and said, no, you come down from there. I don't want you to have to die for your sin and to face God's wrath. Let me die in your place and drink the cup of God's wrath for you and your sins. That's the first half of the great exchange. All of my wrong, the punishment it deserves, laid upon Jesus instead. That the death I deserve, he chose to die. But the other side of the verse is just as wonderful. So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. So that as we trust in Jesus, not only is all of our wrongs shoved onto him, but all of his righteousness is put onto us at the same time. Uh, imagine being in a colossal debt that you could never hope to pay. And there's Elon Musk standing beside you with a bank account worth billions. And when he hears about your debt, Elon makes a simple offer. Should we just swap accounts? so that he inherits all of your debt and at that same moment you inherit all of his credit well on the cross an even greater exchange all of my sin goes to jesus and all of his righteousness comes to me not not bit by bit and drop by drop if i try hard enough and work it out in my life properly but all of it in one great big dollop at the moment that i first believe and as we come back to Psalm 26, that's how we can sing this great song without it sticking in our throat. We haven't trusted in the Lord without wavering, but Jesus did. And in him, this can be our song as it was his. It's the most staggering thought in the world. And so I take it that Psalm 26 will leave us this morning, amongst other things, praising God for Jesus and the great exchange of his death on the cross. I'd love to invite you to bring his steadfast love before your eyes right now to turn your mind to the cross and to thank him from the bottom of your heart for being willing to die for you. God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's a truth that changes everything, uh, and it brings us to our second point this morning. Who are your people? Uh, you don't often get the chance for a completely fresh start in life, do you? Where you go somewhere new, no one knows you, you can be whoever you want to be. I think the last time it happened for me was probably when I went off to university. I didn't know many people in the town I was going to. Here's this chance to reinvent yourself. You, you have to ask, what are my values going to be? How am I going to live? Who are my people going to be? I'd been a Christian for about 18 months, and you'll not be surprised that some people who'd come from a, a faith background ran away from it pretty quickly, and others lent into it more than ever before. Who are my people? Uh, King David wasn't a fresher, but it's clear in the psalm that he has made his choice. So verse 3, for your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in your faithfulness. I do not sit with men of falsehood, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. This idea of walking and sitting sounds a lot like Psalm 1. Can you just uh, flick back to Psalm 1? This is, Psalm 1's in your mind all the time that you're reading the Psalms, along with Psalm 2. But Psalm 1, just on page 448, you just see how it starts. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked nor stands in the way of sinners 
nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. There's a, a famous regression in Psalm 1. You see first someone is walking in the counsel of the wicked. That is, they're sort of hanging out among anti-God ideas and beliefs. But then they slow down to a halt, and now they're standing in the way of sinners. They're starting to put down roots in the company of those who don't love God. And then finally, they sit in the seat of scoffers. They, they take up residence there. They identify with those who have no time for God at all. They just want to write Jesus off and any idea of living for him. And it's quite deliberate in Psalm 26 that David is saying, that is not who I am. I've got the, the steadfast love of the Lord filter on. And therefore, I will not make my home with the people who reject him. Let me stress, this isn't about how friendly you are to your neighbors uh, and to the people that you meet in Morrison's. It's not about whether you're kind to your colleagues. God tells us to love our neighbors as ourselves, to do good to all people all of the time. I hope that's our aim in life. The, the deeper question here, though, is who are my people? It's... Um, made me think of the, the, the Houses of Parliament, and you've got all of the new MPs, and they're lining up either on the government bench behind Keir Starmer or on the opposition bench. And it's a, where you sit tells everybody whose side you're on. So who are my people? Who's, whose company, whose values, whose ideals excite me and resonate with me? Am I living for the same things as the, the people who don't want anything to do with God or those who love him? And David says, God is my portion. And therefore, I do not and I will not sit with those who set themselves against the truth and goodness of God. By contrast, verse 6, I wash my hands in innocence. I go around your altar, O Lord, proclaiming thanksgiving aloud and telling all your wondrous deeds. O Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. It's a very priestly language, the language of drawing near to God. Um, I, I was part of a receiving line at an event recently where a bunch of us had to shake the hands of a member of the royal family. It was not very exciting. I'll tell you about it afterwards if you really care. But as you can imagine, we were given some pretty strict protocol in advance of what we were supposed to do and wear. This was not the day for shorts and flip-flops, apparently, and it was jacket and tie, and we weren't meant to say, yo, bro, and fist pump, or go in for a bear hug or whatever. It was a shake of the hand and your grace, and that's all it, okay. There was a, in, in Exodus, there was an appropriate way to approach the Lord as well, when Aaron and his sons were on duty in the, the temple and they wanted to draw near to God, they, they said, God said, well, you've got to wash your hands and your, your feet first so that you're, you're cleaner. Well, David now says, I'm going to do all of that. Like a, a priest, I'm going to draw near to the Lord. I'm going to parade around your altar. I'm going to proclaim thanksgiving aloud for all that you are, Lord. I'm going to testify to the world of all the wonderful things that you have done. You can feel the devotion in his words. It's not just that he grew up going to church. It's not just that he pops along on a Sunday every now and then because it's the, the right thing to do. This isn't just some sort of nostalgia for cultural Christianity in a changing world. This is a declaration of love. Lord, I I love your presence. I want to be where you are. And you can see how it works. David knows the Lord. He's received the steadfast love of the Lord. And therefore, he loves to be with the Lord. He wants to praise the Lord. He wants to walk with him. And he wants to tell other people how great he is. Uh, you'll have heard a, a, a parent talking about a child or a grandparent talking about a grandchild. And it, from the moment they open their mouth, it's clear how much they love them and they want to spend time with them. And they're always telling you how great they are and some of the things that they've done. It's lovely. It's what relationships are like. And that's David with the Lord. 
doesn't want to be a part of a world that hates God and rejects God's word and turns its back on him. He wants to be in a place and surrounded by people who love God and honor him. And he wants to proclaim his thanks to God himself. Not just because it's the right thing to do, but because he delights and loves to do it. Uh, I was reading the other day that if um, you're in a recovery program, one of the things they sometimes ask you to do is to think about three Ps as you're trying to kind of plot your way back into society. They want you to think about your patterns and habits. Uh, and they want you to think about the people that you hang out with and the places you go, because you can see how, how obviously all of those could be an unhelpful trigger that would take you back down a road you don't want to be on. Someone pointed out that David's knowledge and love of God uh, reshape him in, in all of those ways. When you think about the pattern of his life, he wants to walk in integrity before the Lord. When you think about places, he, he wants to be with the Lord. He wants to worship the Lord and enjoy his presence. And people, he wants to avoid those who will have a negative effect on him and drag him down spiritually. And he wants to take his place in the great assembly of the Lord. And as we read Psalm 26, that's where God wants us to be this morning. First, we rejoice in the the righteousness that is given to us in Christ. And then we resolve afresh to stand apart from the beliefs and values of those who reject God's word and to cultivate a, a godly affection for knowing and loving him. As we close then, let me ask you a question and encourage you to make a resolution. The, the question is the, the one from verse three. What is it that's before your eyes today and on a day-by-day -day basis? What's the, what's the filter or lens through which you most readily look at the world and make all of your decisions? Everything around us tells us to look at the world through the lens of personal achievement and success and accumulation and status and experience and fulfillment. And if that's what you look at the world through, that's what will shape the way that you live. Or is it the lens of the steadfast love of the Lord? What can you do to help yourself keep the love of God front and center in your mind this week? And if you are wanting to look at the world through that lens, as I know many of us do, when you've thanked God for Jesus, here's the resolution. Why not spend some time this week reflecting on the, the patterns of your life and the places you go and the places you love and the people you assemble with and ask God to help you to love what he loves, to avoid what he hates so that this week and every week, we might all walk in life and before the Lord with true integrity, a life shaped by the steadfast love of the Lord. Let's pray together. We want to thank you, our Father, once again for Jesus, the perfect King, the perfect believer, and our only hope the one in whom we have been given all of his righteousness, your righteousness, if we've trusted in him. We want to thank you for that great gift. And with your steadfast love before our eyes, we want to pray for your help that we might look at the world solely through that great lens. And so it may shape the way that we live, the patterns of life that we adopt the places we love, the people we assemble with. Would we love your presence and spending time with you and learning more about you? And would we be strengthened by that to walk in integrity all of our days, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing two things as we close. First from